Hello and welcome back to Unplayable, your favorite show about our favorite games. I'm D House here with Mike, Jay, and Jim. How we doing, fellas? So good. Fantastic. So good. Never better. I'm running Jim, I know a few you've... hours of sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tired. All we heard all day. I'm so tired. Um, Jim, <laughs> I know you're doing great because you had a you had a great week, I hear. I mean, truly the most blessed week you could ever imagine. I did this crazy thing called driving up to Chicago uh, and spent multiple days just playing board and card games with the one and only David House Connect. So call it a dream come true. All I want to know is how many of those days was he wearing his top eight medal? (laughs) Um, uh, Only one. And we did watch Glee the entire time in the background. (laughs) Mike, I told your Glee story Perfect. to my family at my wife's birthday dinner tonight. Really? Wow. <laughs> I was like, you'll never believe this about my friend Mike. <laughs> he knows Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> I feel like it's not that exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. Uh, but no, Jim and I got to play uh, uh, some good Winds of Exchange Key Forge. Um, I've been very distracted by Lorcana and Galaxy Shuffle, but uh, Key Forge, the new set, loving it, enjoying yeah. um, enjoying some some games. Ironically... After we recorded our our competitive deck episode, I got two offers on Wizards of Exchange decks from a guy in Italy who found my decks online somewhere and uh, was making offers. So time. I had to figure out if nice. they were worthy of selling or not, or if I should keep them. So nice. So that was fun. Just wanted to play test and, and jam some Keyforge. I got but. to see Shatterpoint, but not actually play it. So <laughs> it's fun to see the little minis. You didn't actually yeah. play. That's sad. No, we just watched David glue his fingers together a lot. <laughs> I did a little bit of that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what about you, uh, Jay? You you had an interesting 24 hours? Yeah. So uh, this past weekend, I flew up to Atlanta to uh, hang out with my uh, wife's family for July 4th. And that, unfortunately, includes uh, the one and only Sir Stank a lot. I mean, Sir Christopher. Uh, <laughs> and we got to play a few games. And... Long story short, I beat his into the ground every game we played, yeah, except for Star Wars <laughs> Rivals. He got lucky in that. But every game of Lorcana, I won. He's trash. He's ugly. Go look at his YouTube channel. Yeah. T- did we ever <laughs> reference his Maui spoiler reveal on, on Unplayable? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't think we did, but we... <laughs> You should go watch that. Stop watching us and go watch that. Yeah, go watch Sir Christopher's <laughs> Maui reveal on it. It, uh, <laughs> I, I had like a spit take when it started. Like I, <laughs> I had no idea what to expect. So it was. Uh, it's a thing of beauty. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mike, anything to add, or should we jump in? Nah, I just played Marvel yeah. Snap. Our before we jump creatures. in, before Wait. we jump in, guys, uh, our intern Tom has been working really hard on. Uh, our social Tom. media presence. Uh, we've got a, a Twitter. Um, you know, Twitter may be slowly burning uh, itself down to the ground, but we decided to join the fun of the burning down to the ground. And uh, and Tom's been doing a great job. So be, you know, throw him a bone. He's had a tough week. He's got to report to all four of us. Um, so it, help out, old intern Tom. Give him a follow. We've got something like how many followers we got on YouTube or subs on like. YouTube. I don't know, like 2,000, I think, and, and we've got like 20 followers on Twitter. So. <laughs> yeah, Tom, Tom if, if if we don't start to see some fruit from Tom's investment, we're going to have to have a conversation with Tom, so yeah, help Tom intern. out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, expect more from him soon. So follow us there. Join our Discord community. If you're not in our Discord community, what the heck are you even doing? It's a good old party over there. We talk about lots of games and random stuff. It's great. So, yep. Let's talk Both spoilers. Descript- Both links will be in the podcast description. That's Perfect. Right. All right. We're jumping into spoiler territory here, people, uh, because we've got another week full of Galaxy Shuffle and Lorcana spoilers. If you missed it, guys, we we got a spoiler card. This we got this it. cast, this these four guys. We got uh, it actually got a spoiler card uh, we made a video somehow and uh <laughs> mike edited it with edited edited it with all of his um, with tom, and then with then tom. yeah mike yeah. and tom yeah. put a lot of work into it 
Yeah, Tom did most of the heavy lifting for yeah, sure. Nice. He basically just got coffee from Mike while he was doing all the work because that was it was very it was a lot of coffee. <laughs> I can't stress enough how much we love Tom. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, well, we won't get into this now. We'll we'll talk about this the, how the whole process happened and how whatever. But surprise strike uh, again. This is Star Wars Unlimited. In case you missed the Galaxy Shuffle, uh, it's a two cost yellow event. Um, it's just, it's not hero villain. I don't know. I guess you just call it yellow cunning. Neutral. Yeah. Neutral. Uh, attack with a unit. It gets plus three, plus zero for this attack. And you got uh, Cassian just like popping Krennic in the back. Surprise, sucker. Got him. <laughs> and it's a common. Yeah. What do you think? Do you think that's it? a nerf gun that he's using? Definitely. <laughs> It might be, or a stun gun. Yeah, he, he didn't die. You know? Uh, yeah, true. I mean, he did it at some point. We both did. <laughs> Who's got um, feedback? I like this card. I think it's cool. I like yellow cards. Because uh, we haven't seen that many so far. Mm-hmm. I don't think, right? Have we seen any besides this? Uh, Leia, I think, is yellow. Leia, okay. Yeah, Leia's also cool. But... Uh, I think three surprise damage is pretty cool in a game like this. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, it's also sort of action compression as well, where you don't have to like pump up your unit and then open yourself up to it being taken out before you can get value out of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think we don't know a ton about how the game plays, but this seems like it could be cool. I agree. Yeah. And like you can't really do a one to one comparison with Lorcana since in this game you're attacking your opponent's base, which is like their HP. So this you you could kind of compare it, but it would be like questing for three extra. Like, which would be crazy good. Which would be really good, right? So it's kind of the same similar vein, I guess, as that. But uh yeah, like because this isn't um restricted to having to attack a unit, you can attack their base. Presuming they don't have like a big sentinel out or something like that. Uh I th- I think it's a pretty sweet card. Yeah, I do like the flexibility that it also can just like kind of double up against one unit if needed. So it's like where you they might set out a unit thinking like you'd have to two for one to get rid of it. This could allow you to just only swing one in. So it's just mm-hmm. kind of, it's, it's got some good flexibility. It's nothing crazy, but I enjoyed the surprise when it's not done to me. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> All um, right. You can also, you can also use this to trade up into a leader and there haven't been yeah. very mm-hmm. many cards that we've seen that let you like, you, you know, pseudo removal for a leader. Right. Mm-hmm. So yep. it could be, could be a nice uh, surprise. I will say, FFG giving us a spoiler, you could say that that was a surprise strike. No kidding. And I've been loading up that joke for about two minutes. <laughs> Let's go. Been sitting on that one for a while. <laughs> I should have sat on it all night. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of which, I was going to mention this. Uh, I'm looking at a website, www.force-db.com. It has all the spoilers that have been out there if you're trying to keep up with everything. Um, it's all in one place and they're, they're sourcing out where the spoilers are coming from. So our video is even linked underneath. Surprise That's strike. cool. Yeah. Sick. Thanks they guys. Cause they definitely don't have to do that. So I don't know who they is. I'd love to know who they is, but, um, yeah, thanks. I know his discord name. It's uh moon life. Yeah. That's... Moon life. I think Sweet. that's the name. Cool. Thank you. Moon life. He reached out to me first to make sure it was okay to post it on the, on the site. Like, as soon as we dropped it, I was like, yeah, we don't care. That's awesome. Nice. Sweet. All right, next uh, next spoiler is the Imperial Interceptor with some of the coolest art I think I've seen so far. 100%. This is a red space unit that costs four. Um, it is a villain card. It has three power, two health. Uh, it's an Imperial Vehicle Fighter. Uh, common that says, when played, you may deal three damage to a space unit unit which seems pretty good for a unit that you're paying four you only have two health but it does three just by playing it's almost like a surprise strike <laughs> it's surprise <Almost>. interceptor <laughs> it's similar in like it's math right except it costs two more and you get a unit out of it 
but it's, yeah. it's restricted to being a space unit, which might be like super restrictive. Well, if they don't have any space units out, right, and they only have ground units out, then you're like losing value out of playing this. It's interesting. Is I think it's a pretty good card if they do have a space unit out. You're getting a ton of value. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm curious with uh, I guess like from what we've seen so far, it seems like the space units are like tweak down just a little bit on the power compared to ground units. So I'm curious if like people actually play space units. I truly have no idea when it comes to like the design of this is if like you just go all in on ground and try to win that or not. But it seems think, like if there is that like nice balance, that's an awesome way to at, at four that's like a nice like mid game play anyway, where if they're gonna put out some early space units, this should probably have some good value. I think that's where like the mind games will go around deck building for events where mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because if, if yeah, if, like, ground units are pushed a little bit more, then, yeah, it makes sense to put play more ground units. But if you completely neglect space and they have these little two-power TIE Fighters or three-power Interceptors sitting there just pinging away every every turn, um, that can really add up if you have nothing to deal with that. Um, so I think that's where some of the mind games will go in. That's where I think we'll see some real, um, I don't know, some... At the competitive level, I think we'll see some really interesting decisions there um, as far as how to like keep that taken care of on that side. So yeah, it's it's interesting game game theory of like if everybody decides to just go ground, like who who decides to then go space because everybody's going ground, and then now mm-hmm. if you're going on the ground, now you have to include some space units to deal with their space stuff, and now all of a sudden everybody's playing both. So. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the meta game shakes out around that. But this is, mm-hmm. it, you know, classic good enter the battlefield effect. I think this card is pretty cool. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think I think for a lot of like games early on, especially these kind of like does two things on play is always really strong. So it just it may not like last the test of time for being able to do something like that. But I think early on this card will probably be pretty solid. Mm hmm. All right, let's uh, let's keep it going. We got lots of cards today. Um, next up, we've got. Uh, oh, and by the way, our friends over at uh, Saga spoiled the interceptor, um, so I want to give them a little shout out. Um, and then we've got repair. It's a blue uh, one cost neutral, uh, and it's an event that says heal three damage from a unit or base. And that's it. Um, Simple. Which is, yeah, pretty sweet. And uh, that comes, I'm trying to remember who spoiled that one. Main deck. Uh, main deck, is the one yeah. Who that. yeah. Seems fine. I think you're going to use this on base like 90% of the time probably. Just one and for three. And then your three. leader the other 10% or 1%. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like I think of thinking about Lorcana and all the heal cards for units in that game is just like, no one plays any of those. So mm-hmm. I can't imagine healing a unit in this game is going to be very good. But, I mean, one for did three you, to heal did you. Did you lose a bet where you have to compare every <laughs> yes. Star Wars card to a Lorcana card? It's, a, it's a bit at this point. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Um, but, I, I mean, one for three isn't bad value in terms of, like, base healing, so maybe yep. you play it just for that but it seems bad yeah it probably goes into just like a very specific deck that wants this mm-hmm. and then like no other decks yeah yeah could be strong and looking at it. play yeah yeah but I think things that are it. bad are tend to be decent and limited so. yeah. <laughs> yeah in flesh and blood a card like this does see play um but it's a very like grinded out style of game where it's like if your plan is to go aggressive having that just a little bit of extra health kind of just like keeps you above that threshold where you're able to kind of turn the tide. So I could maybe see it in a control style deck if this game has anything similar, the, but that's the problem. such a bizarre comparison for like yeah, the games you're trying to do. Yeah. Cause like flesh and blood, you don't really, uh, aside from the only character that I enjoy playing, you don't really have things in play like that stay in play in flesh and blood. So you can heal mm-hmm. on a turn and then like block out an, an entire attack the next turn. Like in this game, if all you're doing is healing or if you're spending a resource to heal instead of doing something else, your opponent still has that stuff on the board in theory and they're just going to hit it yeah. with you next turn. So yeah, 
Um, yeah, the only mind games I can think of is if they think you, they have you dead on board and sure. like you flip this right at the end to mm-hmm. make some advantageous trades. But yeah, yeah, makes sense. Probably not amazing. <laughs> All right, let's All keep right. going. Yeah. Is that how many more are unlimited? Oh, is this the last one? Last one. Last Let's one. Uh, we, from the, this is uh, Jedi Geek Girl. Uh, she spoiled this one. It's a two cost space unit restored arc 170. It's blue. It's hero. It's got two power, three health. Uh, and it ha- it's a common. It says restore one when it, the unit attacks, heal one damage from your base. So more healing. So we're seeing some themes really develop out of blue. Uh, we saw it on uh, the Yoda unit as well. Lots of restore healing. Uh, maybe a little bit more control. There we go. Probably your mill, your mill uh, color, Mike. Perfect. <laughs> he, uh, what I don't want is for this to be like Destiny, where it's like all the heroes heal, all the bad guys deal damage. Yeah. Like, yeah. Heroes deal damage too. Come on. <laughs> yeah, and dealing like dealing damage is is literally the win condition. Healing is not, and so it ends up being that villain's always better than hero because villains. Yeah advance your win condition and heroes just stall yeah trash i can't wait for a mace windu restore two on a card just for jay to just <laughs> melt inside that restore two would be too though. powerful it'd be a it'd be restore one max a point five <laughs> <laughs> but you have to die roll to see if you actually yeah, get there it. it is you flip a coin <laughs> if heads restore one <laughs> uh, that being said though this is a pretty sweet card I yeah this has good stats it's a turn one play you know, you can yeah, start yeah. with two. Mm-hmm. With basically, yeah. three because mm-hmm. you're healing one. Yeah, so like value maybe like wise. a two four. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, same thing. Uh, good. Two four, whatever. I mean, I see that interceptor over there just sniping this though on turn three. Uh, yeah. Before you can get real value, so that's again where the mind games will come into play. Of puts down turn one, like okay, I'm going to start taking that sucker in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, have they announced anything about like? Is there a sideboard in this game? Have they talked about that yet? I don't, I don't know. Think, yeah, I don't, I don't think, think they've, they've said mentioned. anything about that. I don't think it's in the quick start rules. Okay. If there is, I'm gonna sneak one of those little interceptors in there just to <laughs> pop this sucker. But the, if, with with that mentality, it's like you just don't play any space units because of the interceptor, or do they have <laughs> to all have four more health. Potentially, yeah. We can start <laughs> with it, those thresholds right, when the, cards come out. Because it's like, okay, then I, you just played four costs into your space arena. I played four cost like ground unit that hits way harder on my side or does yeah more. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if, if you are playing this on turn one, like your your opponent can't play that other card until turn three. Yeah, so, so you, 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 of time. you still get some value out of this before they blow it up. Yeah, definitely. I really like the artwork on this card, and I I kind of dig like this. It's almost like a western anime style with the like mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. the trails on the on the ship and everything i like it yeah it i i saw people like not really digging this art but i actually really like it and i i just in general i like the aesthetic that they're going for between ground and space mm-hmm. it, very distinct it, mm-hmm. yeah. i think i'm confused on the flight path of this one though like it looks like it was going sideways for a while while turning and then try to ride itself it's like what you running from there, bud, while you're trying to heal yourself? So, that I mean, it's firing, but it's running from something at the same time. So <laughs> how many battles we fight in here? Here we go. All right. I'm going to get right. the art. We're getting deep. <laughs> That's Star All right. Wars Unlimited. That is your Star Wars Unlimited news for the week. And oh. now we're back. Oh. Before, before we jump off of Star Wars Unlimited, I just want to be excited about the fact that there are two live oh, streams yeah. this month. One, to talk about casual organized play. I still think casual is a terrible word uh, in the context, <laughs> but we can get to that another day. Uh, and then the second is uh, a demo or a preview of the demo decks from Gen Con. That's good. So I'm also sweet. excited to see that. Yeah. One of those is on the 26th is the demo deck one. I can't remember when the other one is. I think it's the 12th. So... 
July 26th. Expect TTS videos from us on uh, <laughs> these new starter decks that they're going to reveal. And no more spoilers ever from this channel. <laughs> but it's fun while it lasted. <laughs> we got one. We got it. <laughs> yeah. After Jay spent all week saying to the people in Discord, oh man, FFG ain't never given us a spoiler. Hey, you gotta do it. <laughs> Surprise. Tease. All right. Y'all ready to keep going? Yes. Let's do it. All right. So I think literally 12 hours after we recorded last week, we got some Disney Lorcana spoilers. Mike and Jay have already played with them in videos for YouTube, but we haven't publicly talked about them. Um, I have also played with them quite a bit on uh, Pixelborn, uh, so I'm excited to dig into these. But first up, we've got Simba. It's a one-cost inkable from Steel. Uh, it has uh, one power, two health. I can never remember all the names for all the different stra- strengths and <laughs> health and willpower and whatever. Um, it's willpower and strength, right? Or it, it, no, yeah, no, it's strength it and willpower, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, so it's a one-two, <laughs> and it has uh, it uh, has one lore pip, has an ability called Guess What. When you play this character, you may draw a card, then choose and discard a card. It's a common. <laughs> I think Mike likes this one. I do. I know. I think I like this card probably more than anybody else likes this card. And probably more than I, like I should like this card. But I think I think in this game, you know, we've seen obviously some of the best cards be uninkable. Mm-hmm. And my theory, this is not borne out in fact, but my theory is that you're able to include more uninkable cards if you have more filter effects like this. So... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every Simba that you play on turn one can, you know, trade a card in your hand that you can't ink for a card off the top of your deck that you hopefully can ink. Hmm. And maybe that lets you play more powerful cards in your deck in general. So, yeah. Interesting. And I like Steel that has two of these effects now with Tinkerbell plus Simba. Yeah. Tinkerbell is terrible, though. Yeah. I'm like pretty <laughs> confident that, that card is just bad. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Speaking of bad stats. <laughs> ooh, this yeah, but this me. card you can play it on turn one. It's mm-hmm. still you can you can still quest with it. It's not really that much of like a tempo hit to play it. You don't have to like forego questing with it or challenging with it to get the effect mm-hmm. out of it. Yeah. So that's think, that's why I like this better than I the also other. wonder there are some some weird situations where you want something in discard. Um and mm-hmm. if you don't like Hades, there's a lot of recursion cards to, yeah, in this to, game, to, and this to, is a very easy way to dump something from your right. hand. There, there have been some moments where I'm like, "Crap, I need something <clears throat> in my discard to take advantage of this other effect." So the fact that Simba can just start creating some some resources in the discard pile early seems pretty good. You also, if you're combining this with something like uh, Stitch Rockstar, which seems to be dominating the current meta, yeah. um, to be able to what, well, what's the timing actually? Do you get to look before you draw? Because when you oh, play, but, oh, interesting. Because when you when you when he when Simba comes into play, you can exert it to draw a card. But if you can look first before you draw, I think my, you probably either get to choose or Simba triggers first. My guess is you get to choose the order. Yeah, that that's what I would assume. Um, I haven't tested that theory in like an actual game yet. Um, but stitch just draws you a card straight up you don't like right you have to right but i'm saying symbol when he comes in exert him oh right you're not you're not looking at yeah never mind that that doesn't matter but it but it it just filters the hand so you can go pull off that combo a little bit more too so not that stitch rockstar needs more power i think (laughs) this card's probably bad i don't when I'm playing Steel, I don't want this in my deck because I'm playing Captain Hook and I'm probably <laughs> playing Fire the Cannons. You're playing already, Goons. I know you're playing Goons. And that's already <laughs> two good. one cost, so it's like I, I I think I guess my argument is I think like that's one kind of steel deck, but I think like this could be a different kind of steel deck if we get sure. more cards that are like this. My other issue yep. with this card is that if it's your turn one play, then you just mulligan to bad. Like you shouldn't, yeah, have, you shouldn't have to play this on turn one for the filter effect unless you just didn't mulligan right. That's po- probably true, but also sometimes you just get screwed even if you did mulligan correctly. <laughs> Maybe 
All right, moving on. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> uh, what we got next? We got Peter Pan. All right, Peter Pan. Uh, this is a green. We got another green card. So yeah. it, it, we officially have more green than red now, right? I think I, I think I want to retract the fact that we wanted more green cards at this point. <laughs> <laughs> if they can unreveal some green cards, classic. That would be, great. be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Peter Pan costs three, and it is inkable. Three, uh, three um, strength, two willpower. Uh, has evasive, which is seems to be very important with one lore pip, and it is a common. I mean, you pro- right now you just play it. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, if you're playing green, you put this in your deck. Mm-hmm. One, it helps you get rid of Pascal's. Two, it's got evasive, so if they don't have any kind of yeah. evasive control, then it's just like free lore every turn. Um, yeah. I mean, the one counter to it would be like fire the cannons take this takes this out. I'm actually glad it only has two health because a three yeah. cost three three evasive would be probably way too good. That's thematic. Yeah, it is. Uh, they probably <laughs> did that on purpose, right? Nice. That's fun. <laughs> uh, it's a sweet card. I mean, it's it's good. It's funny, too, because it says, what's the matter, Hook? Can't you fly? And that's why he has evasives. But this is basically flying, almost, from, like, magic. Yeah, very similar. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) And Hook says, no, but I have a cannon. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it's it's hard to imagine a green deck without four of these. But we haven't seen the whole card pool. But right now, Mm -hmm. I'm like, uh... Just seems good. It's tricky to me because I don't yeah. feel like I'm like thrilled about this card, but it is just that annoying. Like green in general so far has just been that annoying like little brother that just keeps poking you and keeps mm-hmm. pestering you, and they eventually get their way. I think green is big brother, and he's bullying you. Oh, well, <laughs> I was always only ever like the steel, big brother. Steel is the big so. brother. <laughs> All right, yeah, fine. Using using brute strength to overwhelm you. So, so what? <laughs> sure. So like, then what? What's purple? <laughs> what's purple in this metaphor? <laughs> mom, Pur- your little yeah, sister. purple's mom for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Man. And Red's dad. All right, moving on. Who's <laughs> the cool uncle? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got another Ariel. Uh, she costs four. She is blue um, and uh, not inkable. Uh, that seems important. Terrible. Uh, it, Ariel's a 3-3 three, three <laughs> with one Lord Pip with an ability called Look at This Stuff. Whenever you play an item, you may ready this character. Coming in at rare, right? That's a rare? That is a rare. Yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. Why is this not inkable? Because card. I think the card's awesome. <laughs> Because I they, like the card. <laughs> it's terrible. It's, no, Jim, you're wrong. Maybe it's future proofing. Okay. <laughs> it probably is. The, okay, the you live the dream by playing a bunch of items and readying it a bunch of times. But it, number one, there's <laughs> no way that that's going to work in the current card pool that we have. I've tried. Uh, second, like there's a there's a cap to how many times you can actually do it, which is the cards that you've drawn and the cards in your hand, and yeah. the fact that you can only play each item once. Uh, if we get to a point where there's some weird combo of recurring items and every turn you get to do this, like at least twice, maybe it's worth it. But if you, if you can't do this reliably each turn twice, or like, like if you can't play one single item every turn after you play this, it's not worth it. Like on the numbers. Yeah, I agree. I was just looking at it for the ability to just play one item quest with it and then it's ready and then you can't do anything about it so it's just that creature got you the lore you got the item down which you were really excited about anyway and then the creature also gonna stay alive is it worth not being inkable though like that i don't know (laughs) is it you have to forego playing playing so many other cards yeah yeah just playing an evasive card if that's what you're looking for i mean i guess it's technically better than evasive to just ready it after you gain lore with it but then you're only gaining one lore per turn like that's so slow well, you can gain the two when it's advantageous for you to do so. It's just you don't have to if they have, you know, creatures coming at you. So the dream is you have Maurice out and he draws a mm-hmm. card every time you play an item. Yeah. And he decreases the cost of the first item you play by two. So you quest, get to play an item for free, draw a card, and then you do the Stitch Rockstar. You play you quest with Ariel, <laughs> play an item, draw a card. It's another item, quest with Ariel. 
play. The, I don't. That's, God, the, yeah, dream. Yeah. That's, That's the dream. That's the dream. But this sounds like classic decks where it's like the wheels are spinning, but nothing's really happening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like they're 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 the wheels are turning, but there's no engine. Basically, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. we need a lot more item synergy cards for this to be good, and maybe maybe there will be. I mean, maybe that's a fact. This is yeah. rare. So yeah. Uh, but also I'll, like. No, go, go get ahead. multiple of these out. You get multiple of these out though, and they like they do start to compound. They are good in multiples. That's for sure. That's for sure. But I, I mean, at the moment, uh, in the current card pool that we have, I'm not playing this card. Same. When we get that's more fair. item synergy stuff and better items in general, I'll revisit it for sure. Yeah, I'll concede that. We got all right. Move video that you actually like got it to happen a couple. <laughs> yeah, times. yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, that video will be up before this podcast goes up. Nice. So you guys will see it work and me still lose. <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers. Um, all right. Next up, we've got Donald Duck. Another blue card. Um, cost five. He is inkable. He's a 4-3 with two lore pips and ward, which as a reminder means opponents can't choose this character except to challenge. I don't like this card. No. I don't. Oh, it just, yeah, it kind of just gets traded into by things that are a lot smaller than it, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, hook. Uh, uh, yeah, hook. Yeah. Is, I mean, <laughs> what yeah. your one cost can take I paid out five, five for this. Cost. Yeah. That feels bad. It can't it feels be smashed, real bad. though. It cannot. Yeah. But it can be Rafiki'd. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rafiki'd. Yeah. Or yeah. Zeus. What does Rafiki do again? Into, or, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just like a nice like check call though, as far as like okay, you can't target this thing. True. So like AOE. That's true. Still That's, true. It. That's a, but that's it a is, good point. It's like it's like too lore that your opponent really cannot interact with at all. So like your threshold now goes to eighteen instead of twenty is kind of what you're doing. Yeah, that that is interesting. Huh. Didn't hmm. think about it like that. There has to be more inventor stuff coming, right? Like they they've they've. Seeded all these things, Bell, Maurice, now Donald mm-hmm. Duck, uh, Strut and his stuff, all these inventors, mm-hmm. but they haven't like done anything with it yet. There has have, to be something coming. Have we seen any cards that interact with a trait yet? Uh, like, oh, we've seen one, right? Hades. We've seen a few. Hades, Moana, Once Princess. Oh, sure. Right. You got the Musketeers. The Musketeers. All right. yeah. Well, <laughs> There's plenty I have the of worst memory of all time. So. <laughs> so <about none>. <laughs> 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 yeah there's stuff there's stuff so i i expect there to be some kind of inventor synergy in blue at some point can i also just say that strutting his stuff is probably the worst subtitle i've ever seen <laughs> it's bad sorry to never made fine. that but what i really it like doesn't make artwork. sense it should have been mcdonald oh my god <laughs> stop it <laughs> You can't follow up that hot take with McDonald. <laughs> you're, two, you're two for two tonight, Coach. Thank you. Two for two. How I'm, long have you been I'm, sitting on that? I'm using my dad license very liberally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Save ourselves from any future Speaking jokes. of dads. Speaking of dads. <laughs> Good segue. What the heck? Uh, we've got Worst Zeus. dad in any Disney movie. <laughs> We've got Zeus with some pretty sweet art, if you ask me. Um, cost yeah. four. It is not inkable. Um, he's a zero four with two lore pips, uh, but he has rush, which again means this character can challenge the turn they're played and challenger plus four. So while challenging, this character gets plus four, and Zeus is a rare. Rush in this game is super high value. I, agree. I have yeah. experience yeah. now with Rafiki. Specifically, Rush is very, very high value in this game. It feels like to me. Um, Zeus is really efficient too. He's, I mean, he's got good stats for a four cost. He's got two, two lore pips and four health. He has zero power, which kind of sucks. In my experience so far, playing Zeus is like, I, I play him, I rush, I defeat something. But then they just like Rafiki back and take zero damage and and defeat my Zeus and like yeah. I guess I got some kind of value out of it, but it feels bad to just be like rushed back and and now 
kind of take a step back but it, he, it does sort of feel like smash is a three cost for three damage this is like a four cost for four damage and then if you're bad. really lucky you might get a second one one thing i like about this and i just thought about it is that zeus synergizes really well with hercules in that you play hercules on three mm-hmm. you don't bodyguard it but then turn mm-hmm. four you bodyguard and then you know use this and then you, your opponent has to take out your hercules before they can get to zeus so that's pretty cool yeah he's Ooh, su- and he's he's classic he's, bad dad over here putting his son <laughs> in the line of fire if he doesn't get traded back the turn that you play him he's really high value i think mm-hmm. like there's yep. some solid value in this card yeah the fact that he has two lore as well means that he's mm-hmm. like pretty relevant later on in the game yeah, yeah. If yeah, if your opponent plays this, you do feel a little bit of pressure. Like I need to, I need to do something about this. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I feel like he's right, rightly costed at four with not being inkable. Um, I, I like his design a lot. Me too. Sweet. Same. All right. La- I think this is the last yeah, one, right, last Mike? One. Okay. Um, so today we got Merlin. Um, cost. Four, it is inkable. He's blue, self-appointed mentor. He's a three-four with one lore pip, uh, and he has support. Remember that keyword we've had yeah. once uh, hey, from Hey Hey. hey. <laughs> <clears throat> and as a, as a reminder, support is whenever this character quests, you may add their strength to chosen character's strength this turn. And Hey Hey only having only having one always felt like ah whatever, uh, but three is not. Uh, is not a joke. That could that could be interesting. It's really cool seeing a high power support character now. Like mm-hmm. being able to actually see what that support keyword can do. And I've played a few I played like ten or so Pixelborn games today. And he was pretty sweet if you left him on the board. I took him out pretty quick in the first couple games that I played, but then one game I let like let him sit around and when he gets to do the support shenanigans, he's kind of sweet. It's it's interesting for sure. Pair, pairing him with Rush character seems really good. Like this mm-hmm. and uh, Zeus that we just saw. It's like you have Merlin out, you play Zeus, you quest with this, and then Zeus can hit for seven. Mm-hmm. Seems yeah. pretty spicy. Mm. Or, I mean, even I, I even like we were talking about Simba being a one cost one two he's not doing a ton after he's sure. played but for him to turn into a four two later on you, you don't feel bad losing your your simba in a four two yeah. fight yeah it's a really good way to yeah, make make use of your lower power or lower strength characters and this also is a three four which is like a pretty good stat line yeah on its own yeah yeah it's like if this gets two uses it's fantastic i think mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's good it's a good card Pretty cool. I like it. All right. Is that all it, the spoilers yeah. we got? What a rush. Oh, that's all the nice. spoilers. Um, so, Mike, you had an idea for a podcast topic, main topic of the night. Do you want to introduce that to our Yeah, we, we can talk about that. So we, Or have Tom we, do it. We, <laughs> <laughs> we, we've talked amongst each other and... Uh, I feel like this has been sort of a general conversation in the various gaming communities that we're a part of. And it's basically just the, the notion of what do publishers owe content creators and like, what should that relationship look like and what does it look like in the various games that we are interested in? So, uh, this is obviously the perfect time to talk about it since we did get a, uh, card reveal from fantasy flight <laughs> and now i can talk about how they don't actually owe us anything <laughs> uh yeah i think that's great and i i think kind of I, I was gonna allude to this earlier and i didn't but um i gotta give ffg credit they they reached out to us uh like they they said hey would they you somehow knew that this? we existed even though they've never listened to this podcast i, I know <laughs> <laughs> so one of our moms like threatened them with uh hey <laughs> um but yeah they they reached out and i mean i don't know about you guys but i didn't think there was a chance like ever 
uh, that we would be able to do that. Just uh, and and it's not that we were really like looking for that either. It was sort of like, uh, oh, what a happy surprise that um, yeah. that right. we're being supported in this way. And but so there was in in my mind there was no expectation, and there was pleasant surprise when it happened. Mm-hmm. But in my time as a content creator, <laughs> there were seasons early on when I was doing X Wing podcasts and uh, and even in Destiny where I probably felt a little bit more entitled. Uh, to content from them because of how many hours and how much time I was putting into content. Um, and I think a little bit of that probably came from the fact that I was just evaluating, like, this is how much time and like, I should be it like a job. Like my, my input should match my output. And a lot of times it felt like, uh, I'm just pouring a ton of time and not seeing as much, uh, return on this investment. And so I will admit that I actually agree with Mike. I think publishers owe content creators nothing. Like they don't publish games to um, <laughs> to help content creators get a, a foot in the uh, influencer world. Um, but um, uh, but it's a nice surprise when they do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I think while I do think they owe content creators nothing. I think it is smart and strategic for them to align with content creators. So like, I think the entitlement that oftentimes is felt by content creators is sort of like, like I, I get it, but I don't think it's super helpful. And I think like a good publisher content creator relationship is just like mutually beneficial and it doesn't have to feel like a, oh, you owe me this because I'm making content for your game. Like you're making content for that game because you like doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not making money off of this. Like it's not, it's not a, you know, a, a job. Like it may feel like a job, but if it feels like a job, maybe like, you know, try to do, try to do things to make it not feel that way. Um, I don't know for us, like we we've, we've said this before, like we would do this even if we had two listeners, right? Like we just do it so that we can have fun talking to each other and be involved in these really cool communities with really awesome people. And, um, I think sort of getting, you know, card reveals or whatever spoilers, whatever you want to call them from a publisher is nice. I think ultimately, like just speaking completely, frankly, I don't think it actually does a lot for content creators. Like, you know, you get a little bit more exposure, but not nearly as much as you just doing, you know, consistently good content on your own, like for a longer period of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a bit overblown, like how much it actually does, but it is a nice sort of like, um, like way to make you feel more legit, I guess, or make you feel sort of like more, more, I don't know, seen. So, or even if I think it makes us feel like they actually care about the community that they're crafting around the game. Yeah. And not just like uh getting getting their game out there. They care about like catering to the people that actually play their game. Yeah, and facilitating like a thriving sort of like content scene, right? Um, right. How much how much do you think that like the content creation scene and p- aspect of a game helps a game thrive? Do you think I it's think necessary? I, I do, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. I, I think in today's world it is. I think maybe like ten years ago it wouldn't have been that way. But I think like creator sort of um culture is so prevalent in people's lives now where like people wake up in the morning and watch TikTok for like an hour mm-hmm. before they go do something. Right. So it's like that is where people are consuming their media and where people are learning about new things and getting into, you know, like the hobbies that they're into. So, um, I, I think, I, I think publishers really should just look at it as another arm of their marketing, um, strategy because, because that's exactly what it is, right? It's, it's more eyeballs. It's more, um, more, more people that you can sort of put your game in front of. And I think it's actually, um, interestingly like more valuable 
to be a content creator. I, I think I've, I've talked about this before, but like we, we obviously, you know, talk about all the games that we're really interested in. And I think that puts us in a, in a unique position to like sort of be a conduit for publishers to pitch their games to other audiences. Um, so it's like, you know, if you're here listening to us because you're really into Lorcana and we're talking about, you know, the card that we just revealed for Star Wars Unlimited, and now maybe you're interested in Star Wars Unlimited as well, and you're going to check that game out where previously, like, you you either didn't know about it or weren't particularly interested. So I, I think that that's an interesting sort of dynamic there. Um, but in general, I think, like, a thriving sort of, like, content community just, like, makes a game feel more vibrant um, gives the community in general, like something to talk about it gives, you know, it's like, we, we've all been to events where it's like, Oh, you know, did you see the video that this person that everybody's watched, like has, has, you know, released it. It's almost creates like those like water cooler moments, I guess, uh, yeah. amongst like a community where everybody now has like a shared, uh, like, it, it, like shared media, like it, everybody's watching the same TV show. Right. And then they get to come and hang out do the activity that, that, you know, they all enjoy doing together and talk about the media that they watch together mm -hmm. or the podcast that they listen to or whatever, whatever it ends up being. So, yeah. Yeah. For, for me, I think content creation, the reason I do it is number one for the friendship. I agree, Mike, like we're, we're going to be doing this regardless of how many people are, you know, in the views and how many uh, followers Tom can get on Twitter. But, um, <laughs> Uh, for, for, for me, it's it's about the friendships and the relationships. And it's also just I, I heard someone else say this on um, it's uh, it's called the Hello There uh, Shatterpoint podcast. He he said he likes the podcast. He likes to do content because it gives him a way to um, enjoy the game when he can't play the game. And I was like, that's that's a great line. Right there. It's just like, hey, this just gives me an avenue when I can't physically sit down and play some of these games for whatever reason we're not in person or i you know we can't hop online and we can't do the things that we used to do it gives me a way to enjoy these games and so that that's where the joy comes uh for me and i think again my time as a content creator over the last decade plus i'm finally in this like comfortable spot where like uh the acknowledgement and the the success just does not drive what i feel like is valuable anymore um and it's more of like a nice pat on the back when the publisher says, Hey, we see you like, here's a, here's a card. Enjoy, do something fun. And so we did, we did something we never did. And like, we, we literally did a, a skit for our content yeah. creation and we, we've been making stuff for forever. We've never done a skit to my, to my memory. <laughs> no, we have um, not. It was, it was, it was a fun time. <laughs> yeah. So who, yeah. So if we get more, it's like, I love doing that. It's a creative outlet. I, I love that. I, I, it does make me think and wonder like, what if I'm, if I'm a publisher, what are the reasons I don't? Cause you like you said, it's like free marketing in some ways and it's strategic yeah. marketing, but obviously there are some publishers that don't like working yeah, we, with, we can talk groups. about the difference between what Star Wars Unlimited is doing right now and what Lorcan is doing right now, where, well, I was also going to ask like, should we bash publishers that don't give their content <laughs> creators like spoiler cards? I mean, I, I don't know if it like, if, if that is the right framing for it, but I think that it's like probably a, like a strategic misstep, right? It's like, you're not using the network that already exists. Should that... we, should we as content creators feel bad if they give no content creators for the year game spoilers and they just give them to big, Media like Lorcana outlets. is doing right now. Right. So like it's no <laughs> it's no secret. Lorcana is giving spoilers to just like these big, yeah, big media, media outlets. outlets that do games or just geek culture in general, right? And uh like the nerdist, IGN, whatever, all that kind of stuff. But they haven't given any to any of their so far to any of their content creators, specifically like content creators that started when the game was announced like a year ago and they've been doing podcasts and they've been going for a long time and obviously like very dedicated to the game. It kind of surprises me that some of those content creators hasn't, haven't gotten any, but mm -hmm. is that a bad thing? Like, should we be mad about that or no? I, I honestly don't know. It's so, it's so interesting. And the fact that we have two companies that are like kind of taking opposite approaches here to compare like each other two 
is going to let us like really answer this question in like a year. But I think I like I, I think more people know about Lorcana than know about Star Wars Unlimited. Mm-hmm. And part of that is because Star Wars, uh, Star Wars Unlimited is so new and was announced like not that long ago. And Lorcana has been announced for over a year. But um, I, <clears throat> like getting into those big news outlets like is a big deal, right? Mm-hmm. Like if mm-hmm. if you're a nerdist, if you're an IGN, if you're in, you know, game radar, like what whatever the big ones are, like you, you're going to be seen by a lot more people than you would be if you just give your sort of cards and spoilers to content creators. But I think like there's no reason why you can't do both. Like there's plenty of cards in a set to allow you to do both. Um, and maybe, maybe Lorcana will do that, right? Like we don't, we, we don't know yet. Like they haven't re- revealed the entire set. It's possible that like, you know, the last two weeks are just going to be content creator reveal after content creator reveal until mm-hmm. the set is, is, you know, is done. Um, so they could still do that. That that's probably what I would do if I were them. Um, would be like, you know, sort of get get the word out through these big outlets and and sort of bring a wider range of people into the the sort of community or not even into the community, but just like awareness of it. And then like they definitely should give some to content creators, but not because like the content creators are owed that. Because it's like a smart marketing decision. Yeah. Uh, so what? So what do you guys think are reasons why they they wouldn't like? What are what are like just some actual I reasons? Think, like if you're sitting at in an office at Ravensburger and you're like, "There's no way we're giving it to content creators." Like, what are those reasons? I don't think I that think- it provides. It's not beneficial for them. I don't think if they were to give us, but that goes against con- what Mike just said. <laughs> well, I'm saying. If they specifically for Lorcana, if they give us or any other content creator that already does Lorcana content, a spoiler, I don't think they're gaining any other viewers at this yeah. at this moment. Like Star Wars Unlimited is a different case because it's not as well known. But I think at this point, like anybody that's in the board game industry knows what Disney Lorcana is. That's true. Yeah. So so you're saying basically like um if if like because Lorcana content creators sort of already have their sort of niche built, they like and most people already know about Lorcana. Um, Lorcana isn't gaining anything right. by giving those people spoilers. I, I think that might be true. Like ju- just in terms of raw numbers, like it, it's probably not gonna not gonna move the needle. I think it is like it could be beneficial to those content creators. Um, maybe on the margins a little bit, if you know you're directed traffic to content creators that you didn't know existed, maybe, or that you didn't think were like into Lorcana, but they are um, that that kind of thing. But I think I, I I think the impact of that is is like usually pretty overblown of like how important that actually is to a content creator. Like I don't know, you might see like a single digit increase in like percentage of viewership and stuff like that, but. Um, I mean that over time that that's meaningful. Um, mm. but I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think if Lorcana were to do it, it would be to just like sort of ingratiate themselves with content creators. But at the same time, like, does any content creator like stop doing content because they don't, I, I don't think so. Probably not. So like these people are probably going to make content for the game anyway. Like we're, we're still going to do little kind of videos and still like cover the game, even if they don't give us, us spoilers. I certainly don't expect to get spoilers from them. Right. So yeah. <laughs> no, they've definitely never heard of us. <laughs> no, definitely not. What do you think, Jim? I feel like one thing I've noticed, like with, do they give spoilers or do like the companies kind of throw them bonus? Like what's their target audience in a sense too? Like, I, I just feel like for games that are in, like, the Walmarts and Targets of the world, they don't. Sure. Uh, but the ones that are more focused on, like, the local game store, the community, the conversation pieces, all of those things, those seem to be the ones that are more willing to kind of, like, throw that bone over. Um, does does just, Magic do content creator reveals? I not sure i've not been a uh, magic player long enough to know pretty sure they have but in like the past. i think they have in the past right i don't i don't know how actively do they do it i'm, I'm trying to like I, I now am thinking about and haven't really ever thought about this before but like what what's the origin of of this whole thing right like i know fi- like ffg has done this for a really long time with their mm. content creators right um and some you know in better ways and some in worse ways but um like, I, 
Hearthstone did it. I know for a fact. Um, like I watched a lot of videos about, you know, spoilers that content creators specifically got. Um, but I can't think of that many other physical card games that like really did did that. So it's it's interesting that it's like become such a prevalent part of card games now card game culture yeah Mm -hmm. and i mean the even the card game that like we're working on right now like we we've revealed all the cards on our own um i mean the game is brand new there's no content creators that exist for it quite yet but um like i i do plan on like you know making sure that you know for the next set that comes out like the community reveals a lot of it Mm -hmm. um because I, i think it's just smart it's really interesting too that like me and Jim have talked about this before ourselves. Uh, Flesh and Blood gives content creators a ton of spoilers. I actually almost don't like the way they do it now because they do it in like a two week span. It's just, yeah, it's too much. Like, oh, I hate it. Influx <laughs> of spoiler cards, which sucks. I have not heard. I have not heard anybody say they love that approach. How well, how does it keep existing? If I think or are we that just people that are diehard diehard fans of it don't mind. But isn't it, isn't that is that what magic does i think they do like two weeks right two weeks of spoilers Maybe, or do they yeah, do more than know. that I, I don't remember it's been a long time since i've really paid attention to magic but um, yeah I, the hardcore players are probably into it because it's just like so you know so you exciting can't, you all can't once. really like once the game comes out you can't really do it too early because then it's like you're you just released a set and you are gonna just start spoiling like a month later and I don't know. It's it's kind of it's a different approach after the game has been released. But either way, they give a ton of content creator spoilers, but also they have a very interesting message in terms of like uh there is a prevalent content creator that was trying to do streaming at like large events and do um narration of the games and all that kind of stuff. And he was having a lot of issues with like the venue and then internet and neither LSS or the venue would help him with getting internet or like, I I don't know the whole story. Jim could probably enlighten us more than I can, but James white, who is the lead of LSS pretty much said like, if you want to do this stuff, that's fine, but don't expect anything from my company to help you kind of increase your brand because of what you're doing you're doing it for yourself you're not doing it for us like you if you're going to these events with all your own equipment to do streams and give provide content for the community that's fine but you're not doing it for flesh and blood you're doing it for you and your your brand and you shouldn't expect us as the publisher to help you when it doesn't benefit us and we already are doing streams and stuff like that uh jim could probably explain it a little bit better than I did, but that was kind of the gist of what James said from what I remember. No. Yeah. You, you crushed that story. Uh, <laughs> sorry. There's like fireworks going off over here. Nice. Uh, it's not even 4th of July anymore. <laughs> um, no, exactly what you said was spot on. So, and even just the idea of, uh, Oh my goodness. That's why I don't know if you guys can hear this on it. Those are fireworks. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it sounds um, like somebody like banging pots. Yeah. And pans I thought they, the I thought someone was cooking or something. <laughs> no, no. Fortunately, fortunately not while doing a podcast. It just, uh, <laughs> our neighbors like to see things go boom. Hopefully nice. not my car. Who doesn't? <laughs> uh, but no, I, I, I think it was an interesting conversation piece. I think strictly from like the money standpoint, it makes a lot of sense um, with the conversation from flesh and blood. But I can openly speak to there's been lots of games that I've just stopped playing because there was no content for it. So like it almost it's almost like a when you're like hosting an event, if there's like a entrance fee, it feels like the event holds more weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like if I see a lot of content for a game, I'm automatically going to assume, oh, there's people playing this game. I want to be a part of this. That's a great point. Uh, mm. That's just typically how I soak up like new games. If it's worth my time, first thing I'm going to do is open up YouTube and see what's available because y'all know I'm not on Discord hardly ever. Uh, <laughs> oh, we know. That's a that's a really good point. I I I do the same thing, and I didn't really like realize that until you just mentioned it. But yeah, when I'm getting into a new game or when I'm interested in a new game, the first thing I do is go on YouTube and like learn, you know, try and learn about it. And if it looks like there's only like two people making videos about it. I just kind of assume that like, you know, the game's game. dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. So, but I, I don't think 
that is the same conversation as should companies throw bones to content creators. It's right. yeah. just so, a weird paradigm of like people should just want to talk about it because they think your game's cool. So make the game cool enough that they'll want to talk about that, it. That, I mean, I'm going to go full circle here. I, I don't, I don't think content, I, I still don't think content creators are owed this, but I think like it is in a publisher's best interest to create the most vibrant content community that can possibly exist around their game. And if giving content creators card reveals is meaningful to them, even if it like by the numbers probably isn't, then I think it's still worth doing because you can sort of create excitement around just like content creation in general around your game. I think it's like the meta game of like content creation and, yeah. uh, you know, like <laughs> even, that even relationship. if it doesn't provide the content creator any additional views or subscribers, mm-hmm. like when you get sent a card, you get excited about it and you get excited to make content about it. Yeah. Which makes you make more content about the game and in 100%. turn right. produces more content on YouTube for other people to find and realize, hey, this game has a vibrant community. So I think in a roundabout way, it does help the publishing company, even if it doesn't bring yeah. new, new players immediately. What's, what's that old saying? Something like all ships rise with the tide. Like when it's like if if the tide is like if there's conversation going and moving like all ships, content creators, publishers, everything like rise up with it. Like it's not like, oh, this person didn't get one. They did. Or, you know, I, I do. I really do think that's true. I don't I don't uh, I never feel like slighted if there's like oh, that that published or that content creator got this thing and we didn't like it's like great. That just gives everybody more to talk about because mm-hmm. I think. Probably like you, to your point, Mike. Like the average uh, player of a game who doesn't do cr- content creation forgets who even was the first to talk about the card. Or yeah, I mean, ninety percent of the time they're going to see it in a Discord channel or something like that, not ever know yeah. that it was revealed by a content creator. Hundred percent. Yeah, it, I think it's more to keep the conversation going. I mean, like we, yeah. we hit that lull of like Lorcana wasn't saying crap for like <laughs> six weeks, and I forgot the game existed most days because it was just like there was no conversation. There's mm-hmm. nothing to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just like, oh, well, like, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, and there's so many games out too where it's like, well, I, there's, there's Shatterpoint, there's Star Wars Unlimited, there's all these other games. I'm like, well, I'll just go pay attention to those and Keyforge. And, and so, yeah, in my mind, it's like just a way to kind of like inject a little like conversation in the community that it's like these publishers of games, they're, they're they're almost like it's it's almost unfair to call them game publishers. They're community publishers. Like they're they are publishing, they're creating community around a game, but um but it's it can't just be like, here's the product, see you in four months, you know, right. when we release the next one. Like you're that it's like these companies that actually have like someone who's thinking about the community or like community engagement, stuff like that. I'm like, okay, they get it. They understand like what's really happening on the player side. Um, because I do think, I mean, game designers and developers and the logistics, they've got enough going on. They're not, they don't have time to think about what did Unplayable talk about this week, unless they just want to listen to us in the background or something. Um, so I do, I do think it's about, it really is about, I, like, who cares about, we've talked a lot about spoilers and card reveals, but it's so much bigger than that. Like, there's interviews and there's, mm-hmm. like, other ways that I think publishers and the way that they invite certain, like, Ghost Galaxy invited uh, Tabletop Royale to um, to come and stream the first Vault Tour uh, this coming weekend. So, and that everyone's really excited about that because every Tabletop Royale is like the reason Keyforge really got through the pandemic, like because they would just stream these live games. And so it was like this nod to be like, "Hey, yeah, these guys are legit. We're giving them, we're trusting them with like streaming this massive event. We're all going to be tuning in and and watching what's That's going cool. on." So, in other words, whenever Star Wars Unlimited has actual OP. We can be casters, essentially. Oh, my <laughs> word. This is what we're putting ourselves out there to do. Here, God. you three cast. I'll go win with Jar Jar Binks, and you guys can cast my victory. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'll go in with Jar Jar. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. Mike is the only one on this cast who actually has played Jar Jar competitively. So I top eight at a regional with it. Let's yeah, go. that's fantastic. And, and it broke the internet almost as strong as Solo Sabine broke the internet. 
almost as strong as his text. like cheater video broke the internet. <laughs> you, you, oh my you've really impacted the internet a few times. Yeah, in some pretty bad ways, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What to be clear, if you've not listened to to our previous episodes, I was not the person cheating. <laughs> <laughs> but he was on bass guitar and glee. So it, that start is, the rumors. That is allegedly true. <laughs> <laughs> uh that's good. All right. Cool. Any other thoughts? Right. Any, yeah, do we have anything else to say about that? Or I have that almost all? no other thoughts left in my brain, so Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I think, think we got it. Sweet. All right, well, uh, that's us signing off, guys. Go join the Discord, follow the Twitter for Tom, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye. Bye, y'all.